Russia's slide into authoritarianism has also seen an acceleration to extreme militarism, or perhaps one could characterize it as a regression to a highly militarized society, media, and education system. One of the most disturbing aspects is the indoctrination of youth. Ian Garner wrote with empathy and insight on this topic in his terrifying book, Z Generation, Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and of course, share the channel with your friends. It will really help boost the video's popularity in YouTube, and it will really help people to discover uh, new authors and new insights. Ian Garner is an historian and analyst of Russian culture and war propaganda. He's motivated by two questions. What drives Russia's obsession with war, and why have so many Russians in the past and present fallen for militarism. Ian is also a world leading authority on the myths and propaganda surrounding the Second World War Battle of Stalingrad in Soviet and Russian literature. And he has been interviewed for the Washington Post, Rolling Stone, New York Times, BBC Vice, News, Mashable, and many, many other channels. And I'm delighted to say this is the third time uh, he has uh, come back on the channel. Well, I'm delighted to be back. So thank you for having me, Jonathan. And uh, I must say, I was very privileged to actually meet you in real life, so I can affirm that you are not an avatar or an AI construct. You you are uh, there in the real world, and uh, it was a fantastic event at, uh, I think it was Pushkin House, wasn't it, uh, earlier in the year? Yeah, Pushkin House back in the uh, in the early summer, and it, and it was a great event, and the pleasure of meeting was all mine. Well, let's dive into this rather intense topic, and uh, we follow on from the excellent conversation with Alison Edwards, so if you haven't watched that one, I invite you to watch that one, then watch this one in order. We're going to be covering similar ground, but also hoping to sort of break new insights as well. Um, and let's really start with education, and one area which I'm not quite so sure on, we've got the new patriotic classes, it'd be good to break down what those consist of and what the intent is behind them. But are they evenly rolled out? Is it the same kind of stuff, whether you're in the big metropolitan areas or the provinces or even those areas where perhaps ethnic Russians are in a minority? Do you, do you get a sense of, of there being any differences in the rollout? So no, the, the material is produced by the Ministry of Education centrally from Moscow. It's disseminated via a website, so anybody can go and look up the website and find the materials. There are different lessons for different grades groups. So there's lessons for, I think it's grades one to three, four to six, and so on and so forth, up through the years until grade 12. Um, but the material is identical, and I, I've heard it being taught this year, and this year is already the second year that these lessons are being taught with some modifications each year. It seems to be exactly the same all the way from Moscow to, I have some contacts out in Kamchatka in the, the very far east who were reported that the, the lessons took place out there exactly as planned. And the government puts together these really quite appealing little information packets for teachers that contain slickly produced videos. It has a nice sort of easy to watch, easy to consume Instagram aesthetic. This is not half an hour long propaganda rants. It's three or four minutes punchy stuff. They'll clip in uh, TV shows, music, relevant films, trying to make it work. There are slideshows given to teachers, again, nice quality productions, along with scripts for teachers of how to teach the lessons. So the idea is, you know, when we look at these scripts, we can even see not just a lesson plan, but literally the words that teachers can use, lines and whole paragraphs that teachers can just read out, ask a question for the students and then wait to see if the students give the correct answer and sort of follow the flow chart of the lesson, the lesson through to make sure every child in Russia is getting exactly what the state wants them to get. Now, whether they are or not, I'm sure there are many exceptions where teachers are trying to subvert these lessons, where they're skipping parts of this, where they're not showing the videos, where children skip those classes where parents are keeping them home from school and we've seen some fairly organized activity on on the behalf of some of the opposition organizations trying to support that kind of work but on the whole this is a nationwide phenomenon 
And this sounds fairly well organized. It sounds fairly slick, but it also sounds like there's a very clear intent behind the materials. So is this trying to just get people behind the short term policy of the war? Or is this a more long term, perhaps more pernicious attempt to militarize Russian society? I, I, the emphasis is very much on the long term. If in the Western press, I think today we're very hyper focused on the stability of not just Russia itself, but today's regime, the health of Putin, what's going to come after Putin, then the timeline that the people working at the Ministry of Education at least have in mind is very much longer. So just to take the first few lessons that have been or are going to be taught this year, we've seen three topics because we're just about to start the third week of, of classes. We're recording on September the 14th. These things are, are taught on usually on Mondays or at least intended to be taught on Mondays. So the first week, I believe, I think I'm getting this in the right order. The first week was a series of lessons about the so-called day of knowledge. That was about Russian patriotic scientific achievements in the field of knowledge. So, you know, all those scientists, artists, cultural figures who are very, very familiar to us, overwhelmingly the emphasis is on ethnic Russian figures and in particular men. So you won't see you won't see many females, you won't see many minorities, and you certainly won't see many pacifists on that list. Very little mention of the special military operation here. The next week, so this was this current week, the topic was, I forget the exact title, but something like Russia, my country. And it was about understanding Russian geography, but Russian geography with an emphasis on the might, the breadth, the size of Russia, the territorial wholeness, historical integrity of Russia. So we can see how this plays into, into current conflicts, right? And, and arguments about colonization and what it means to be Russia as a country. And then the, the coming weeks classes, I think are the most interested if you're in, interesting, if you're interested in militarism, the topic is all about this girl who was killed during the Second World War, Zoya Kosmodimianskaya, who was uh, an 18-year-old partisan, supposedly, according to the Soviet myth, at least, um, supposedly a partisan who volunteered from Moscow to go behind the lines and carry out missions, and was caught after a couple of trips and, and hanged by the Germans. And in Soviet legend, she became a, a sort of almost a, a secular Marxist saint. And the way that she was talked about then, and there's lots of literature about this, is a, is, is a saintly figure who, like the orthodox saints of the past, is there for as somebody to be imitated in their absolute dedication to the motherland. And I think if you're interested in present conflict, then these lessons about Zoya are the most interesting because that is a figure that the state has come back to repeatedly over the last few years. They funded a big budget movie in 2020, which was mostly a flop because it was pretty terrible. That was just about Zoya. So it was a biography of those. It was a bit, the production quality was OK, but it wasn't very interesting. Um, and what is really interesting about this is if you look at the lessons, there is a beautiful moment in one of the slideshows where there is a picture of a young boy and a young girl who are clearly suffering during the war. They're behind the lines, you know, they're all caked in mud and dirt. This is the suffering of the past. And next to this, it's not labeled as such. There is a still from a propaganda video about today's Russian families, which was released at some point last year in explicit support of the special military operation. And the still shows a young boy and a young girl, blonde, blue-eyed in traditional Russian dress, running through this golden cornfield with a blue sky. And when that video came out the first time, I said, well, that doesn't that scene look a lot like the Ukrainian flag? This strip of gold at the bottom, this big blue expanse at the top. And so it is, it is just 
so pointed it can't be a coincidence that that is the visual that they've gone with today and of course once again there are not so much undertones as very loud overtones of a particular ethnic focus in this vision of, of militarism one of the questions i asked shay and it was really a thought that occurred as we were talking um and she was talking about the reinforcement of historical narratives you know once the appropriate narratives, the, the good stories that the government wants to communicate are sort of chosen, and there may be a, a great variety of them. They're then repeated in a variety of media and they're repeated over and over. And I did ask, you know, is this got less to do with the sort of dialogue, um, more to do with the kind of religious catechism? The image you've created here, when you think of a, a school, at least I think of a library, somewhere you can dip into, acquire knowledge, where you have a range or plethora of different stories, debate, often contradiction, etc. What you're describing seems to be, if we were to turn it in, you know, this analogy into something physical, you're describing a church with secular martyrs, saints. These are almost like the, the stained glass windows you're supposed to come in and admire and absorb and get that experience, but really not, not question it or, or bring your own stories to it. You're, you're presented with a, a beautiful reality. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I do conceive of this in religious terms. The state certainly conceives of it in religious terms because it also propounds these narratives from the pulpit in, in Orthodox churches and Everyone from the patriarch down to local priests seems to be regularly weighing in with the same message that the young need to sacrifice themselves. But I think, and certainly there is this, this sense in which the aim of education is re reduced from spreading pluralism, understanding the world and questioning the way the world works to repeating catechism by reducing pluralism down to a singular view of the way the world works. But also more fundamentally underlying this is something of a, a mystical and allegorical understanding of the way that history and the way that time works. In that history is constantly repeated, constantly circling around over and over again, playing out these same mythical narratives of sacrifice, death and resurrection. And thus we see that today's special military operation is meant to be a repeat of the Second World War. We don't need to harp on about that endlessly because we've all seen the propaganda, we've all heard the stories. And that's actually being backed up by these lessons in schools, where every part of life, and even the more, when you look again at those lessons about important things, lesson plans, every part of life begins to be touched by there is, a, there is a theorist, Cynthia Enlow, who talks about the creeping of militarization into day-to-day -day life. She's not talking about Russia, but she talks about the way that in militarized societies, you often don't notice that the militarization is happening. And once again, we tend to focus on the very loud drum banging of Solovyov and Skabieva, who were on you know, first channel every night competing it seems to say the most outrageous things we tend to focus on the youth army when it is out there with with guns and learning to throw grenades and dressing up in hazmat suits and gas masks this kind of stuff but actually when you look at those lesson plans when you take something quite banal like the lesson about russia my country we're learning about geography and in amongst those lessons about geography, we suddenly find little images of youth army children on campsites, just going about day-to-day -day life. They're not doing military activities, but the military is inserted into the everyday so that it becomes commonplace. That's a little like Trotsky's idea, isn't it? The, the militarization of everything from workplace to school place and, and, and so on. So it permeates every aspect of society. This, this mention of propaganda is interesting, though, because earlier in the week, uh, speaking to uh, Alison, she suggested that actually Solovyov, Simonyan, 
we do focus on these and partly because they're so terrifying, but also in the same way that some of, you know, the, the Trump footage, some of it is quite entertaining in an incredibly ghoulish way. And it, it's horrific to say that. But these characters are eloquent and the things they're saying are absolutely outrageous and they trigger strong emotions. But the point was made that the youth, I use this in a very broad uh, sense, aren't necessarily tuning into that and aren't necessarily turned on by that. So there are other mechanisms for getting the attention of younger people who may find the propagandists fairly absurd. Um, and that includes TikTok, that includes, as you say, the sort of subtle education, that includes, um, you know, Z bloggers that have turned into, into celebrities, uh, making it sort of cool and using this very different kind of uh, language. Um, do you think this is all a, a conscious construct and, and, and what are the different aspects of this ecosystem where they try to feed militarism to, to a younger generation? Gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> it's a multi-part multi question, I think, Ian. Sorry so about that. Many part questions, about six books worth of questions right there. Um, the idea here is, and again, this goes back to something you already mentioned, the idea of this sort of multi-pronged approach. In, in my conception, the way this works, and let's get a little bit theoretical, is basically what does every human being want? Stability, harmony. Not just externally in terms of having a safe place to live, but also internally there is a psychological mechanism to this. When you look into, into theorists of trauma, not the psychologists themselves, but in the way that trauma plays out in individuals and culture, there is this sense that we're always driving towards creating a narrative of the self in society that is that is harmonious with what's going on around us. And that's often the reason why we're able to make huge leaps and accept huge cognitive dissonances, like thinking that you know Russia is doing good things in Ukraine, even though you must know or a part of you knows that there is something terrible going on as well. And so the state is constantly on the one hand trying to break you down and shatter you and trying to say, you don't know what to believe. I'm going to fire 16 narratives at you that are mutually contradictory. This is the so-called um, fire hose of falsehood. But it doesn't just end with firing lies. It also ends, or rather, it, it continues with giving people a means to resolve that fragmentation that the state itself is constructing. And that means creating little bubbles of reality, whether it's social media groups, whether it's TikTok groups, whether it's joining something like the youth army, whether it's doing well in school, simply by repeating the narratives that are told to you and receiving approval from the people around you, all of those different things give you a way to say, internally to yourself at least, I am whole, I am good, the criticism is ending, this gives me a means to have a selfhood within the society that is exceptionally damaged in Russia. It is a violent and traumatized society in many ways. I'm not saying that excuses Russian behavior in the battlefield, I'm merely pointing out this is one of the reasons why people spring for this propaganda. And that is very powerful when the state has also spent the last 20 years experimenting with this stuff, not often in a very calculated scientific way, often in a trial and error kind of a way, because they simply have the vast resources to throw at creating lots of different youth projects all at once, seeing what works, they saw what worked in the 2000s, the early 2010s, lots of material collapsed. There was lots of battles for control between different factions within the Kremlin. And now they've landed on the youth army. And indeed, this new group, the so-called Dvizhenia Pyrovich, the movement of the first, what was hailed as the new pioneers. That sounds like horrifically like something out of Star Wars, doesn't it? Like the New Order. It's... Um... Uh, and it's also very it's really stylized, creepy. isn't it? I mean, the uniforms themselves are extremely stylized, something like you might see out of a Gerald Scarf cartoon or a, a dystopian film. 
Yeah, the, the aesthetics of all of this is very fascinating to me because it combines, and again, thinking about this collapse of temporality, the idea that time is, is allegorical, that it doesn't matter what is past and present and future, it combines czarist insignia, insignia from the Russian Federation, Soviet symbolism, and maps it all onto, on the one hand, traditional military uniforms. So we see the beret and we see the khaki pants and the boots. And on the other hand, very modern westernized design features, because we also have in the youth army a red t-shirt, there's a relaxed t-shirt. The leader of the youth army, Nikita Nidzielski, uh, sorry, not Nidzielski, that's another Nikita that I have in mind, Nikita Nagorny, will often turn up wearing a hoodie. Very relaxed, you know, this is sort of laid back, cool militarism for the for the young kids. And Nagorny looks like he's about 12. He's actually in his mid to late 20s now. He looks like a child himself. If you Google him, you'll, you'll see what I mean. And they've, they've always experimented with this. Looking back 20 years to, to Nashi, the first very big youth movement, although it was nowhere near as big as the youth army is today, well, everybody got handed out T-shirts and most of the so-called members of Nashi were no such thing. They were just bust in for the day, given a T-shirt, stick this on, wave a flag and then go home. And, you know, you'd find the T-shirts in the bin outside their rallies because nobody really wanted them. Today, that's changed. And the army, the uniform has become when you look at the, the sort of the TikTok and Instagram groups and, and accounts that, that push this stuff, including children's own accounts, the uniform itself has become fetishized. It's become an object of desire. There was a really great but creepy TikTok video I saw where a couple of youth army kids had filmed themselves putting on a sort of a fashion show and acting out this scene. Allow me to introduce you to the, the summer 2023 youth army collection and sort of talking through the uniform about how gorgeous it is look how it's ironed it has no creases in it you know creating turning these these modalities of militarism into something that's desirable is so important if you want to, children to buy into not just picking up the gun and shooting but the idea that the military is normal this part of everyday life, which is how it creeps and creeps and creeps. I mean, the inverse, of course, is that it's mockable. And of course, you Ukrainian and uh, NAFO memes make great play of this. But of course, that's a different informational bubble. That's not something necessarily that uh, you know the Russian youth get any access to. The question here, because this science is sounding very much like it's engineered by marketeers, which as you'll know, is the, uh, yeah, we, we, won't, we won't dwell on that too much, but put it this way, my, my day job is commercial propaganda. But what you've described here is a process of test and learn. You try something, it fails, you try something again, you throw lots and lots of different sort of like spaghetti against the wall to see, to see what actually comes out on, on top. Um, there's another concept, which is called touch points, which is that, if you hit someone with a particular message once, it's not going to sink in. And in fact, it's not going to have authority or veracity. But if you hear that same or a similar uh, piece of information from multiple sources in different places, maybe using different tones of voice, that not only gets your attention, but it creates a sense of authenticity and veracity because, well, it must be true because all these different people have said it and they've said it in different ways. Is there an element here of how Russia is using different channels like uh, Telegram, social media, television, education, as you know, to, to create almost like this, this ecosystem of information, uh, this bubble that people can then um, assume is, is reality rather than a construct? Almost. There's only, there's only one thing that I have to add to that. And that is the choice of the word, is Russia creating a bubble? No. The intent is to create a hundred, a thousand bubbles. And I, I like to think of it less as bubbles at all than as a, as a hall of mirrors. Going into one of those old fashioned fairgrounds, I don't know if you went to them when you were a kid, 
And you go in and you just see the same reflection everywhere in slightly different forms to the point and if you want to get really theoretical, go read Baudrillard on, on mediatized realities and that sort of thing. Sorry, I had to stop myself there before I went off on a very dense tangent. It gets to the point of standing in a hall of mirrors in that way where you, you cannot tell what is real and what is not real. And therefore you pick your own reality. You make your peace with the fact that you live in something you live in something that is whole enough. And it becomes impossible to distinguish between the messages coming from the inside, the outside, what's real and what's not. And there is there is good evidence to suggest that this creates this sort of quivering tension internally in the individual, again, which perpetuates this sense of fragmentation and trauma and is likely to make you more liable to accept something or anything that is seems to be harmonious or peaceful even if of course what is internally peaceful for you is an external war waged against ukraine it's a kind of informational stockholm syndrome isn't it you're traumatized to the point where you'll embrace anything your captor gives you any kindness in this sense it's informational coherence Absolutely, absolutely, and I, I think again, these are these are metaphors that are all not quite perfect, but will hopefully get the message across that it's not. When you're thinking about what it is like to be in this sort of environment, it's easy to imagine that well, we could we could just tell them the truth, but the problem is all we do when we deploy the truth is we, we drop another mirror into this hall of mirrors. It's just another reflection. It's just another version of reality. Why should they pick that version of reality rather than any other? You'd have to be made of very strong moral stuff to reject all the other easier options that are around you rather than just saying, you know what? Two plus two really does equal five. And it's not just Russia. We have to point out that I think that same theory uh, of a sort of uh, almost like an ontology or an ecosystem or falsehood, um, that uh, people are entirely susceptible to that in, in every society. And, you know, those who've gone down the, say, sort of uh, COVID vaccine denial rabbit hole, that may upset a few in the audience, but... If you've fallen down a sort of alternative reality conspiracy theory rabbit hole, you enter a similar hall of mirrors. And no matter what that might be or what led you in, you'll tend to find then uh, a sort of commonality. If they've mentioned one conspiracy, they're very likely to bring up another. Um, the anti-Semitism tropes often will, will surface in that same hall of mirrors. Um, so it's not uniquely Russian phenomenon, but is it unique that the entire resources of the state and an oil-rich state uh, are behind the, the creation of this? Is that the big difference here, the sheer scale of resource and intent behind this kind of weaponization of information? Well, the scale and intent of, of the state, of course, is unique. Nobody else has done it in quite this way, and nobody else has thrown this much money and this much power behind it. And nobody else, therefore, has been afforded the opportunity of trial and error in the same way that Russia has afforded itself over the last several decades. The other issue is simply that conspiracy theories have existed well before the Putin regime in, in the Russian environment you can go back to the 1980s and the growth of sort of strange mysticisms and odd odd sort of uh, celebrity occultists and I, that doesn't mean that i think there's something gene uh, genetic in the russian mindset that makes people more likely to believe this stuff simply that the russian population was always wandering through this sort of traumatized minefield for, for several decades. And that made them much more likely candidates to spring for this sort of stuff. And, and now what we've got is basically a sort of QAnon state. 
I suspect maybe the absence of agency, the absence of politics as we'd understand it, debate, opposition, and even the sense of individual agency and responsibility. I mean, that's possibly what it would drive people um, into this conspiratorial thinking, because that maybe gives the sense that you're gaining some control over your world. So we, we often hear Russians talked about as being apathetic. And certainly, I think, when you look at the 2000s, they were encouraged to be apathetic in a certain sense, in not to interfere in politics. But that didn't mean to be apathetic in other ways around society. They, they were still volunteering in their communities. They were still working in their communities. They were doing things for the common good in various ways. And over the last 10 to 11 years, the state has been encouraging Russians to be equipped with a very simplistic and reduced agency that exists purely as a binary. And the binary is you are with us, come inside where you'll be welcome, you'll be a member of the community, or if you choose not to, you're against us, you are, and you are anti-Russian and therefore bad, you want me on the outside. And we see that, we see that today to go back to those lessons about important things. If you look at the, the lesson about Zoya, the, the Soviet partisan in World War II, even the lesson for the very youngest grades, so we're talking kids four, five, six years old, just out of kindergarten, is, were your grandparents involved in this? Did they fight in the war? Would you do the same? And now the answer is very clear when you look at the way that the lesson is scaffolded. And the implication is, if you do so, then you are good and you are holy, you are imitating. Again, this is religious, right? Or you're against us if you say no. And that's a very powerful and simple lesson to teach to children. But it always gives people a binary, a sense of agency, a sense of ownership in something in the construction of the self. But and and, and it is a real choice. But at the same time, it's not a real choice. Because For those who don't buy into it, it also has a purpose, does it not? Which is to create terror and fear and isolation because you see all this going on. You don't know whether other people are simulating play acting within this system or whether they genuinely believe it. And if you open yourself up, then you could be denounced, you could be imprisoned, you could be beaten, you could be tortured. So is there that other coercive aspect to this? Absolutely. And I think to contextualize this, we've been having a lot of discussions over the last 18 months around, well, Russians say X, but do they really believe it? In particular, around opinion politics. And the point is, when you frame it in the terms that you just did, it doesn't matter whether people believe it or not. It matters when you are that Russian child sat in the classroom that you have the impression that other people believe it because that strips you of your ability and your willingness to speak publicly against it. And guess what? With the lesson plans that you have with what's going on in society, you also probably don't have the language to express your opposition. You don't have competing narratives of what it means to be a good person. And this is something I wrote about a lot in the Z Generation book. It's not just about the horrible children and the awful fascist stuff. It's also about the young gay kids, the queer community, the ethnic minorities who say, I don't fit into this, but I have to fall silent because I just can't find a way to speak about it. And I feel like, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. I feel like there's nobody else who thinks the way that I think. That is a very powerful phenomenon. It's terrifying as well, isn't it? And the, the other aspect of it is that I only start to really realize, um, and that was in talking to um, an extraordinary journalist, uh, Grigor Artenesian, who was working with Ian Curtis on his documentaries. And he was really talking about this idea of war as entertainment. Not only, I mean, we tend to think of it as brainwashing and it's all kind of negative, but there's an aspect here 
that makes it extremely seductive. Um, if that is the environment you're immersed in and there's a history of militarism and dare I say, you know, a certain sort of glorification of, of suffering, but there's a very strong entertainment aspect to it. And we were talking about sort of third Rome, obviously, as the as the sort of ideological concept. But it got me thinking as well, there's another analogy here, which is that what you've got in Russia is sort of bread and circuses, keeping the masses entertained with rather gory subject matter. Um, and that, that people are, are, are not just treating it as either terror or ecstasy. They're also just, you know, relaxing to this backdrop of war that's now become endemic in their, in their lives. I, I actually want to push back a little bit on that mm -hmm. because I think in, in the West, we certainly do have a culture of war as entertainment, as pure entertainment. Go back, look at, for example, World War One, and what do you find? You find, at least in 1914, lots of upper class and middle class British boys going off to fight for the front and thinking, well, you know, tally ho chaps, this is going to be a good old game of cricket, isn't it? And, you know, really writing about it, I've probably got the book somewhere here, but Paul Fussell is the great author of this and, and the documenter of this phenomenon. It, people really did conceive of war as a game to be played against people who were just like them on the German side. In, in Russia, war is consumed as part of culture, but I don't think it's entertaining in the same way. It's meant to be consumed as a diversion. It's something worthy of your time. You should watch the movies. You should go to the theme park, which seems garish that there are military history theme parks that you can go and look at. But you don't go to get glammed up and have a great time. You go as you would go to a, a church, sort of, um, you know, an event at your church after the church service in the West. That is, it's meant to be enjoyable. It's an admirable diversion, but you go with a sense of awe and reverence and propriety at the same time. So there is not this sort of ironic letting go of the self, as we might think when we think about how we consume war in the West. And maybe you feel morally good, morally justified that you've done this, you've sacrificed your time and attention to a very worthy cause. Um, as I was asking the question, I, you know, I heard the audience screaming at me, have we ever seen the History Channel and the British obsession with World War II? I know some people even mention that, I go, like, what are you talking about? You know, war as entertainment is, is huge, obviously, uh, here. Yeah, of course, but I think it's a different phenomenon. And, and and we, as a culture, and I'm I'm talking about someone who was born in Britain, although I haven't lived there for a long time, and I think things have changed in the way that the war is talked about in Britain. But it seems to me that Britain and the West is removed from war. We are distanced from war. We haven't fought a war for a long, long time. Not a war that involved civilians, not a war that involved direct sacrifices. It's always at a remove, right? Iraq, Afghanistan, these are far off places for most people. Very little direct activity or direct connection for most people to those that would have died or fought in those, in those places. Therefore, we can continue to consume World War II as a great glorious adventure. And I certainly grew up on Saturday afternoon matinees on BBC Two watching Where Eagles Dare and the Guns Navarone or whatever else was on. And it just seemed like fun. Russian war culture is, is not the same at all. It's always done with this reference and uh, reverence and this, this sense that this is something to be imitated at any time. And once again, and I'm sure this will have come up many times on the channel, the difference between our never again and the Russian, we can do it again. Our never again, because we believe that war is yesterday's business. Russians, we can do it again because we're ready. We've consumed war in a way that's prepared us morally and spiritually for this, rather than consuming it as pure entertainment. Certainly the idea of suffering has 
there is a certain attraction in Russian literature, and there's a certain nobility in suffering. And I think that that's profoundly different to almost all the Ukrainians I've spoken to, um, none of whom want to suffer, none of whom think it's noble to suffer, none of whom want that in their lives. They want to banish that from their lives and their literature. Unfortunately, they can't because it's thrust upon them. But in Russia, there seems to be this certain um, almost sort of thirst to, to, to suffer and, and this label of nobility on it. Is that reflected in some way in the education and the sort of formats that we've been talking about? I, I, th I think so. And I, I don't want to overplay the sense or the idea that every Russian wakes up every morning thinking, how can I suffer today? But there is certainly when you look at these these cultural elements of the way that the war is presented, certainly the elements that the state has been playing up for the last 20 years and the last 10 years in particular, there is this sense, and it goes back to the Christian religion, that only through suffering can purification be attained. And that is that is the Judeo-Christian myth, right? That's that's the Messiah. The Messiah has to die. It's not something that, gosh, we wish we could have avoided. It's part of the part of the story, part of the way that history unfolds. The tragedy of the way that this is conceived of, at least in the, the Russian state's terms, is that unlike in Christianity, where the revelation is meant to make things better, in the Russian terms, the utopia never comes because the promise is always short term and therefore requires more suffering, more death, more war and more cleansing of the self and of society. And of course, of neighboring societies like Ukraine in order to attain some sort of utopian end. But it can, it can never work. It's, it's, you know, it's a philosophy that just doesn't make any sense that is impossible, that is utterly at odds with reality. But if you're a devout Christian or even someone brought up in this atmosphere, and imagine you're a five, six year old now in your second year of lessons about important things, hearing this stuff for the second time, even if your parents are opposed to it, well, now you get your smartphone, you log on to TikTok, you see a few videos, you click like on a few Things from the front, some of your friends are talking about this. A couple of your friends are in the youth army. Suddenly, these messages become multivalent and they seem to come from many vectors at once. And it's easy to see how, having been broken down, you begin to buy into this, this very bizarre world in which suffering actually creates the end of suffering. And this is the last question. I think it's going to be quite a short one. Um, and it leads on, I think, to, you know, the, the next interviews that I'll be doing in the coming weeks. And that is, is this militarization of education, is it, in the short term at least, preparing people for another potentially massive wave of mobilization? And is it preparing them to acquiesce to that, not resist or flee? I think there are... Broadly speaking, the lessons about important things are not about that. There is some effort through through them and through other activities within schools to draw older teenagers into careers within the army, but not on a mass scale. If they were preparing to, to call up a million 18-year-olds or however many 18-year-olds there are in Russia, you would see a lot more activity. It would be pushed a lot harder. This is a long-term project. This is a project about saying, well, this... This war, probably we have enough people right now. But what about the next war? What if this war just sort of slowly burns over the next two, three, five, ten years? We just don't know. Certainly with the youngest children, they're being prepared for some sort of war, but a war that is conceived of in much bigger terms. A war that isn't just about Ukraine and Russia, a war in which... Russia is at, at odds with the world, at odds with reality, and at odds with modernity, in which Russia is going to have to be constantly fighting. And it is this fortress mentality, this bastion mentality that is being inculcated in young children. 
That's a, a terrifying place to uh, end, but it's very forceful, very poignant. Ian, thanks so much for coming back onto the channel. And I strongly recommend people to check out your book, Z Generation. Thank you.